Amen. All right, I need for you to take your uh, Bibles out. And I need for you to take your thinking cap out of your back pocket and dust it off. And imaginarily put it up on your head. I'm going to ask you a tough question. One that I've been asked before. Can God make a rock so big that God himself can't pick it up? Can God make a rock so big that even God can't pick it up? Now that's a, to me, a very perplexing paradox, particularly in light of God's response or the angel's response or the words of Scripture that are recorded in Luke chapter number 1 and verse number 37, for with God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing shall be impossible. You find that statement in the context of the visit to Mary, where Mary discovers that even though she is a virgin, she is going to have a child. Mary is told about Elizabeth, even in her old age, who has already conceived and would also have a child. <clears throat> With God, nothing is impossible. How big is God? That's a question that pops up occasionally. And sometimes I have gotten into deep psychological discussion about the size of God. If you are ever involved in children's ministry, somewhere along the line, you're going to be asked the question, how big is God? The answer to children, it's bigger than you can imagine. God is bigger than you can imagine. Of course, the next question is, is he bigger than my house? Is he bigger than the Empire State Building? How big is God? You know, church, when we measure something, we, we generally think in terms of length and height and depth. How big is something? When we, we kind of feel like if we can measure something, we can understand it better. We can put it in perspective. We measure, measure with inches and feet. Well, I'm sorry. We measure with centimeters and meters, depending on how old you are. Something that we can measure. We measure in miles. We measure in light years. How quick can light travel? We measure in light years. When we try to measure God, though, in these terms, we run into this problem. God is not made of stuff. God is not made of stuff. This is made of wood. That's made of concrete. Those things we look through are made of glass. I'm made of blood vessels and bones and skin and flesh and mostly water stuff but God's not made of stuff therefore God really has no dimensions spatial descriptions don't really apply to God in fact God's not made at all God's not made God is pre-existent before anything else was God was God is eternal. If everything were to pass away, God would still be. Simply because 
He is God. He is eternal with no beginning. In Genesis 1, 1 in the beginning, God created. John 1, 1 in the beginning was God. God has always been. He has no start. He has no ending point. That's why Jesus said in Revelation 21, other places, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. That means that God has always been kids and God will always be. And nothing can interrupt God from being God. John 1 and 3 says, All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Speaking of Jesus the Word, who was equally God. God is God. As intellectual adults, we may kind of chuckle when a child asks, how big is God? They might actually chuckle at you a little bit when you try to explain how big God is. Because that's a very difficult thing to do in terms that we can all relate to. Church, I think we need to be reminded. And I think we need to remind ourselves sometime of how big God really is. We need to remind ourselves how big God really is. It's not anything new that I'm going to share with you today. Everyone faces problems that are sometimes bigger than ourselves. Problems to which we cannot come up with a solution. I can't fix it. I don't know how to change it. I can't do anything about it. How many of you has ever said, I can't do anything about it? Dale raised his hand if he was honest this morning, but maybe he can do all things. I can't do nothing about it. We're often proclaiming frustration. Sometimes we look at them sweet little kids and say, I can't do anything about it. There's just some things we can't do, and there's some things really that we may not understand, and everyone faces problems that sometimes seem bigger than we ourselves really are, and we go through things we didn't think we would ever go through. We go through some things that we thought we could never go through, and we found out that we could after all, because there's something bigger than us, there's something bigger in our problems. Where do we turn when we think we're in over our head? I've been in situations where, oh man, I bit off more than I can chew. Somebody asked me a strange question. I won't tell you all the details of our conversation. I was putting up some lettuce and somebody come through. And I said, well, I've been in three fights in my life. They won't know if I was a fighter or a scrapper or whatever. Because we thought we had an incident there at the store where we thought it was going to be physical confrontation. And I jumped right up there and this person saw that. And I said, hey, I'm backing him up all the way to the hospital. I'll be behind him carrying him in. I don't know what we're going to face, but God's big enough to help us. Sometimes we get in over our head. The first two fights I was in, physical conflicts, I won. The third time I realized I was in over my head. And so I grew up and said, I don't have to do that no more. And hopefully you never decide that you feel like you need to take things in your hands because you feel threatened. How do we cope with fears beyond our courage to fight? How do we pay bills that are more than our income, more than we got in savings? How do we conquer enemies that are too strong for us? 
How do we tap into God's power? When our faith is too small for us to overcome things, what do we do? Well, church, that's when we got to remember that we serve a mighty big God. I mean, He's he very big indeed, even more than that. God is transcendent, surpassing, super excellence is our God. Wow. So big and remarkable is God that we can't fully comprehend His supernatural essence. And at the same time, knowing that we are made in His image, knowing that He loves us, that He cares about us, and that He's able to provide for us, we love to quote Paul's words to the Philippians, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory. I underline that in my Bible, the words by Jesus Christ. Because I know that through Christ everything is possible. And Christ in me makes me able to face everything with confidence. I don't know He's big enough to take care of me. Whether the question is how big is God? Whether it comes from a child in a Sunday school class or a scientist in a laboratory somewhere, the answer really comes down to this. This is really profound. God is big enough to make the universe or the universes. And He's small enough to know and love us and provide our every need. How big is God? I've asked myself that question in the past. How big are you, God? If you'll turn with me in Isaiah chapter number 41, I'll show you that Isaiah says that God is bigger than our fears. Isaiah chapter number 41. If you have your Bibles, if you understand what's taking place in Isaiah chapter number 41, and so the passage pictures really, if you will, a court scene where Israel is on trial. And God presents Israel's history to the world, how He's provided for them. Verse number 4 of that passage, He says, I, the Lord, am the first and will be the last. I am He. He says in verse 1 of this passage, Keep silence before me, O Israel. Uh, excuse me. Uh, be silent before me, O coastlands, O islands. Really what he is saying, he's speaking to the Gentile world. If you really get theologically in and understand what's going on, God is speaking to the nations and He is saying, You have saw how I have proved myself through Israel. And you will see in judgment that I am God. And if you read on, you will find out that they remain silent. Silence is a picture of judgment. Oftentimes, and He says in verse number 10 to them, Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes. I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Even though judgment is about to come upon you as a nation, O Israel, those of you who are faithful to me, I will protect you. He says... Don't be afraid. I think fear is probably the biggest enemy that any of us have. It's common among everyone. From our littlest to our eldest, from our youngest to our biggest, every how you want to put it. How many times do we have to assure these little ones not to be afraid when the storm comes along? And the thunder rolls and the lightning strikes and the wind is blowing. We say to these kids, don't be afraid. Everything is going to be all right. Don't we? We all understand fear. 
Fear was the first evidence of the fall in the Garden of Eden. Eve, then Adam sinned. It came the time of day when God walked with them in the garden that He had made for them. After they had sinned and God called to them and finally Adam responds, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. He was afraid because he knew he was guilty before God. And there is a certain fear that all Christians need to have and that is the fear of the judgment of God upon you if you live Choose to live in sin, disobeying God's perfect will for your life. Judgment's coming. Amen. For all of us. And you wonder why I stand up here week after week and harp about examine your lives, examine your lives. I love you, I do, I love you, I do. But I really don't care if you think that sometimes I sound like a broken record. Because I'm going to tell you the most important thing you can do as a Christian is examine your life. And examine your lifestyle. And realize that there's some things that you need to stop doing that you're doing. Or God's going to judge those things. And His judgment is not good. I'm going to say that again. And I think that all of us in here are to shout amen. So when the tape plays back they'll think we're full. Huh? The judgment of God upon your life is not a comfortable thing. But it is a good thing. Restate that. It is a good thing. Because it helps us to know that we ought to do better. God's letting Israel know you ought to do better. But you don't have to fear because I'm going to steal. I'm going to take care of you. Listen, God was here before fear came on the scene. And He will be here when all the fears of all the ages vanishes away. God's still God. And we don't have to fear whether or not God is going to take care of us. God guarantees us that He is greater than all of our fears. When He says, I am with thee, He's with us. You consider all the fear knots of the Bible. That'd be a good sermon to preach, wouldn't it? You saw the fear knots of the Bible. You got to remember people of faith who conquered their fears. We teach our kids about the story of Moses. Terrified to go back to Egypt. And yet God gave him courage. We think about even Joshua. Can you imagine Joshua? We teach our kids about Joshua and how he became the leader after Moses and led the children of Israel on into the promised land where there were great giants in the land and great foes and they had to go up against those and they had to, to fight for their very survival. That's God, what God told them to do and that's what God expected them to do. And yet Joshua overcame his fears because he trusted in the Lord. Now what about David? David was a man that overcame his fears and we teach our kids about David and Goliath and we relate that story to the giants that we have in our lives and how that while David looked like he was too little, he looked like he was outnumbered and people even made fun of him. What are you doing? Even his own brethren, you can't go up against David. Are you crazy young boy? You're just a little kid. Get away. And God, had, and God gave David so much courage that David said, I can do this because he knew God was going to help him. God's bigger than our fears. The resurrection of Christ ensures us that He's already overcome our greatest fear. What's the thing you fear most? Is the thing you fear most getting home in the ice? You don't look so bad out there. I believe we'll make it. If you're afraid you can't make it, I'll live two blocks over. And Karen's got chili in the crock pot too. I can tell you, it's going to be a good day. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid that the bank's going to repossess your home? Your car? <coughs> that might happen. I don't know that might happen. Are we afraid that the government's going to come in and shut us down and tell us that we can't be a church anymore? That might happen. It might happen. But I'm not afraid of that day. Are you? The biggest thing that I'm afraid of 
is dying. Not, I'm not afraid of where I'm going to be when I die. I'm kind of afraid of how I'm going to die. You know? <laughs> I've heard preachers say it, and I've said it before too. And Connie told me, better not wish that. I said, do you remember this? I said, I hope I die in the pulpit preaching. And she said, oh, that'd be terrible for the church. So yeah, that'd be, that's a little selfish. I, I don't want to die up here in the pulpit. I, that is kind of selfish. <laughs> but, I mean, but listen, Christ has, Christ has conquered death. And, and you know what? Because we know that when we die in Christ, He'll resurrect us to life eternal in heaven. We don't even have to fear that. So knowing that Christ has overcome that, we really don't have anything to worry about, do we? And so we're back in Isaiah's courtroom of judgment and God proclaims to His faithful, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I will strengthen you. Be not dismayed, He is saying, do not be disheartened. Uh, do not be deprived of courage. Don't be dismayed. Because God's big enough for us. God is better than our faith. Matthew chapter number 17. I'll invite you to turn. See how easy it is for me? I knew where I was going to turn. Matthew chapter number 17. And it's a great little lesson uh, 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 that Jesus is teaching in chapter number 17. After he heals a boy, uh, and he reaches, he, listen, he heals this young man. He rebukes the demon that's in this young man. Uh, uh, the demon comes out of this young man. And the disciples are like, we, we, re we rebuked that demon. We, we couldn't do nothing about it. We tried. And, and, and the man's daddy, uh, the little boy's daddy went to Jesus and said, Hey, listen, man, your team let me down here. I mean, I, I, look, I thought they had some credentials. I, 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 thought these, these, you know, I thought these were supermen or something because they was part of you. And, and listen, they let me down. And Jesus says, hey, don't worry. I, I, I won't let you down. And he was a boy. And I reckon a little side note is, you know, you, you can look at the deacons of the church. You can look at the teachers of the church. You can look at the leaders of the church. And you can look at the preacher. And, and, and all, you, you should have all the answers. Will you let this happen? How come we ain't done this? How come we ain't done that? I, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> Ask Lonnie. I don't got all the answers. Lonnie well, probably don't have all the answers either. Because the truth of the matter is, none of us can do everything that we want to do exactly when we want to do it unless it's God's perfect will and He causes it to happen at that very time. Say amen. Are you with me? Yeah. I know. You're going to get home. We, we're not having church tonight. We might as well stay together a while. Because the truth of the matter is, this man came to Jesus and he had a problem. And Jesus says to his disciples, if only you'd had a little faith. If only you'd had faith. You see, it, it, it's not really... The, 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 it's not the size of our faith really that's important. We don't have to have great, 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 great amounts of faith. I wish we did. But really, it's the strength of our Lord through our faith that makes the difference. After all, isn't it? Amen? Sure. Mountain moving faith rests in a God that's bigger than our faith. Because he's bigger than our mountain, amen. You remember Miko Moses that, that did not want to go into Israel because he was so afraid? After through all the trials and all the things that happened in Egypt, and, and finally they're let go, and they and here they're making it their way, and they come up the Red Sea, and Moses probably scratched his head. I, I really didn't think about how he's gonna get across this Red Sea, God, but and then all of a sudden he sees the, the dust from the chariots following him. And, and you know what? <laughs> a meek old man raises up a little old rod, a little old stick, and lo and behold, the, seas, the Red Sea parts. It wasn't really Moses that parted the Red Sea. It was God that parted the Red Sea. 
God is bigger than our faith. Huh? Because sometimes we don't trust God enough and still God comes through. Now y'all get this real clear. Real, real clear. There's times when we don't trust God enough and still God comes through. So really, it's more de it's dependent on God. Yes, your miracle, the miracle you need to receive is somewhat dependent upon your faith to ask. Huh? But God's bigger than our faith. You remember fear, fearful, grieving Martha uh, standing by the tomb of Lazarus, her brother. She didn't have faith enough. And yet when the Lord spoke and, and Lazarus, her brother, came forth out of the tomb, she probably said, Why did I ever doubt you, Lord? Because it's bigger than our faith. You know what else? Psalm chapter number 50, verse number 10. Just Psalms chapter number 50 in general. Let's look at that. Psalm chapter number 50 in general. <coughs> We've learned this morning that God is bigger than our fears. God is better than our faith. Let me say also God is richer than our debts. He's richer than our debts. A debt is something that you owe. <coughs> Notice what's taking place in Psalm chapter number 50. Well, we want to start reading. Let's just start reading verse number 10. I'm sorry, take me a minute to get to where I can even do it. God, the righteous one, who in verse number 1 of this is called the mighty one, God the Lord, the one who has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. He's talking about God. This is what it says. This is God, say, God saying, verse number 10, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills is his too, by the way. So I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field. What does he say? They are mine. He says in verse 12, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine in all its fullness. It all belongs to God. He may entrust you with it, but it belongs to God. It don't matter if you have a small little lot in the middle of town or you have multi, multi, multis of acres in the country or whether you have an apartment and the stuff that's in that apartment it's not really yours, it's God's. The Lord giveth and the Lord could just as easily take away but God entrusts us to be good stewards with that which He gives us. And so our Heavenly Father has no shortage of funding. The church has a great debt for a building. And God will meet that debt through those of us who make up the church. <laughs> It's just a building, but it is a tool. And when we dedicate it to God, God's going to take care of it. If y'all believe that, say amen. It's a tool. God's richer than our debts. And our Heavenly Father has no shortage of funding. And oh, by the way, heaven will not shut down unless the spending bill passes Heaven still operates because God owns it all. Someone said, and I wish I could remember who said it, no creditor has anything on his ledger beyond what God can provide. And sometimes in giving, we tap into God's balanced supply 
Is it Luke 6 and 38 that we sometimes put up here? Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down tight. Packed. Overflowing. You can't outgive God. God's richer than our debts. And you know what? Psalms chapter number 18 and verse number 3. You've turned so much. Just let me tell you what it says. It really teaches us that God is stronger than our enemies. I will call upon the Lord, the psalmist wrote, who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. I believe Asaph wrote the psalm. The psalmist knew that God was big enough to provide his safety. God's bigger. God's better. God's richer. God is stronger. God's big enough. God's big enough. You see, the psalmist knew that God was big enough to provide for his safety and security, and I am securely in the palm of God for all eternity. And I don't worry, God's going to take care of me. C.H. Spurgeon once said, The clefts of the rock are safe hiding places. The clefts of the rocks are safe hiding places. And I'm sure that he was making an allusion to the side of a rock mountain where there is a split big enough that you could squeeze into and oftentimes that split opened up even into a greater, larger room that you might call a cave. That, but it was a, place of, it was a place of hiding where a person could actually go in those splits of the rock and actually become a part of the rock. You get the picture? We are a part of God and... We are securing God, and God is stronger than our enemies, and abounding hope. Besides that, we have the armor of God to protect us from all of our foes because God is big enough. Say that with me. God is big enough. In John chapter number 4, in verse number 24, God reminds us that He is a spirit. God is spirit as such. He has no material. He has no physical form. And this characteristic of God is difficult to understand. And obviously it's difficult to explain. God is bigger than you can imagine. God's bigger than you can imagine. So don't even imagine how big God is. Just trust God in faith. Trust God. God is bigger. Whenever you're facing something that you can't face alone, don't imagine that God's not big enough to help you with it. So I guess to answer the paradox, no rock. God, can God create a rock that even God can't move? The answer is no. No. No rock is too big for God to move out of your life, however. If He chooses, if you allow Him, He'll help you overcome any obstacle in life. He's big enough to make the universe and he's small enough to know and love even me. Can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? Questions like that are asked by atheists trying to prove that God doesn't exist or try to prove that God's not powerful, that he's just a man or, or something like that. See, what this paradox lacks is the vital information concerning God's nature. And we don't really fully understand God's nature. Still, the answer to the paradox is no. Since God is infinite, He is not contained to the laws of nature. If God made something so big that He couldn't pick it up, He would make something bigger than Himself. <laughs> and God 
is bigger than everything. And so the question that really needs to be asked is, will you allow God to remove the boulders from your life? And will you trust God in every area of your life and will you allow Him to move those obstacles from your life that cause you anguish? That bring you doubt? Will you trust Him to take away that element that plagues your health? Will you turn over your resources to God? Will you put your faith in God knowing that God is bigger than all your problems? God is greater than all. Can you imagine how big God is in you? The more you give yourself to God, the more God grows within you. And there's really nothing that you can't overcome. How big is God? He's big enough to take care of you. He's big enough to take care of your needs. And He's big enough to do what none other can do. And that is to wipe away the sins and iniquities of your life and give you a perfect standing before Him and put His righteousness into you and with Him, all things are possible. Because we serve a big God. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So if you're ever asked the question, can God make a rock that is so big that God couldn't even move it? The answer is no. Because God is bigger than anything and when you're bigger than anything, nothing will ever be bigger than you. That last part was deep, wasn't it? I'm glad we can trust God. So trust God. He'll take care of us. He'll take care of us. How much He's proven Himself in the past, how He proves Himself in the present, leaves me no doubt that He's going to continue to prove Himself in the future, and I'm going to trust Him and know that He's big enough to take care of me. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 If you have a need today, God's big enough. The altars are always open. Sister Connie, come, let's just sing a verse. Maybe there's something in your life that really seems to be overwhelmingly perplexed. And you don't know what you're going to do. Oh man, to step out and come to the altar with this few, well, that'd be hard to do. Gosh, that'd be hard to do. Sometimes the most difficult steps are the most rewarding in life. Don't let the devil keep you from a blessing. You trust God because He's bigger than all the issues you got going on in your life.